everyone in this small lecture i want to set up some concepts uh, so that we're comfortable with them in our head uh, learn a couple of greek letters and prepare ourselves for what's to come uh, so what we've done so far with phylogenies is first of all build them then uh, use them for uh, comparative analyses use them for um, uh, species delimitation, uh, things like that, uh, for taxonomy. But here we use phylogenies for uh, studying diversification. So actually how biological diversity arises through time and how we might detect the signatures of that on phylogenetic trees. So uh, first we're going to revisit a concept that we already saw in species delimitation. That's the Yule process, where, for example, the generalized mixed Yule coalescent uh, used the Yule pure birth model for the process that is supposed to shape the tree in the deeper nodes and then in the shallower nodes its uh, coalescent processes. So the Yule process uh, simply assumes that every lineage is equally likely to speciate or to split at any given time. So if you start out with one lineage, okay, at some particular rate that lineage might split. And so then if such a split has happened, we are now playing the same game but with uh, two players. So on average the waiting time till the next speciation event uh, has been divided in half because now there's two players and previously there was one so either one of them you know is more likely to win that lottery more generally as the number of lineages increases uh, the waiting time till the next speciation event therefore becomes uh, on average one over n where n is the number of lineages that are in the game So one way to kind of visualize the process is that uh, there is a parameter lambda for the rate, the birth rate. And so the only way is up. We can go to from one to two. I guess from zero to one would be a little weird. Um, I mean, it happened once in the history of life on Earth. <laughs> and then from one to two, uh, from two to three, uh, uh, at infinitum. So this is the pure birth process or Yule process. Okay, um, we know that uh, the history of life on Earth wasn't one where there was only just accumulation of lineages, there's also extinction. So uh, you guessed it, the, uh, the next process is a process where we have births, just like before, uh, which have a birth rate of lambda, uh, but now we also have deaths. So uh, uh, under the null model, the uh, death of a lineage is equally likely at any time for, for all lineages. So basically these lineages are traveling through a field of bullets through evolutionary time and once in a while one of them gets hit. So what we then get in terms of diversification is that we now have to basically calculate the net diversification rate. Uh, um, so that is the speciation, the births, minus the extinction. So for example, where you then simulate trees, maybe because those need to be proposed in a Bayesian run, well then it kind of makes sense if the net diversification rate is positive, so there's more speciations than extinctions. Otherwise the tree just dies out, which is, I mean, that also happens, but that's not that useful uh, under many circumstances. So then what, what does that look like in terms of like the realized diversification? Well, uh, here we're traveling through time, and so we're building up our tree so every one of these events is a birth, the birth of a new lineage. Right? So we had one, here we have two. And so they keep traveling towards the present, but once in a while uh, one of them is hit and uh, dies out. So here this is game over for this one, 
and here for this one, here for this one, here also for this one, okay, it's a little more subtle visually, but this one goes also extinct. And I point that out because then if we stretch out the tree such that we only keep the remaining lineages, we get the one here on panel B. So this is obviously a bit more of a rarefied tree. And one thing that uh, you might notice is that now these nodes are a bit closer to the present on average because something has been dying out here and there's also been an extinction here. So that's the birth-death process. Uh, and this is basically the mechanism that we'll see more of. So uh, uh, just kind of remember, okay, lambda is birth, mu is death. Greek letter L, Greek letter M. In this case, not uh, corona variants. Now then, uh, so far we just uh, assumed that both of these rates are constant through time. Uh, but maybe that's not always the case. Maybe there are uh, circumstances in evolution where, um, you know, all of a sudden things are good and there's a lot of rapid diversification uh, or maybe uh, at, during some interval things are bad and there's a lot of extinction. I think we can all think of multiple of these uh, cases in uh, the grand history of life on Earth. Uh, and so, you know, that can happen and we might want to detect that on trees. Uh, and one thing that's really instructive uh, when we do that is to look at what's called the lineage through time plot. Uh, so these three graphs here at the bottom are lineage through time plots or LTT plots. And uh, the first one on panel A is one where there's rate constancy. Okay, there's a little bit of stochastic variation, especially in the early nodes. But uh, for the most part, it is this linear. So what are you supposed to read into this here? Well, the x-axis is time before the present. So here we are at the moment where we arrive at these tips. And here we are at this root here. Then the y-axis is the uh, number of lineages, but on a log scale, as you can see, because it goes like 1, 2, 5, 10, 20. So anyway, th okay, there's a little bit of an acceleration here, but for the most part, uh, once log transforms, this plot is basically linear, especially if we compare and contrast with, for example, this one, where you really see an early burst that lasts for quite a bit. So you can see here that there's quite a lot of nodes near the root, much more so than in this one. That's what we're looking at, right? Here, lots of nodes. Here, fewer nodes. So here, kind of a bulge. Here, less so. And then panel C shows the opposite. Uh, so here, we have a whole lot of nodes uh, near the present. And actually, that can come about in multiple ways. So one of them might be that near the present, all of a sudden things are awesome, and so everybody's diversifying. Yay, lots of lineages accumulate here. Uh, it could also be that actually this whole period was really horrible, and we're only looking at like two survivors that made it through, and a whole bunch of other biodiversity that was here, has uh, not made it to the present. So we would not be able to see that on our tree, right? We don't have a time machine. Uh, and maybe if this is, for example, not based on fossils, but on molecular data, well, we can only sequence things that exist in the present, okay, with a little bit of ancient DNA, but you get the point. Okay, so there could can be rate variation through time, and perhaps we just want to express that in a, a single uh, letter, symbol, number, uh, and that's this uh, gamma that you already saw here. Um, so, okay, let's not dwell too much on this, but uh, there's numerous metrics that can express, for example, early diversification or later, and a pretty common one is called 
pi versus gamma. And um, what is kind of uh, convenient about that is that you can uh, generate a uh, basically a, di a distribution of what you know under the null model what the gamma values would be. And with that distribution, you can then put your own tree next to it of the same size, the same number of tips. And it might just be in here, or it might here significantly more recent divergence and diversification, or here significantly more ancient diversification. So it is a pretty simple thing to test. Um, and for example, here it is done in R just by, uh, you know, uh, doing very simple tests here by first calculating this gamma statistic with the A package. And okay, there you can do the test. Let's not worry too much about it. Just where we know that there are metrics that tell you whether a tree has early bursts or later ones. Now, what can also happen is that it's not so much early or late, but that it's specific to some lineages. And for that, there are also metrics, uh, two of which are you know, from the olden days. And both what they are trying to capture is essentially the asymmetry in phylogenetic tree shapes. So if you uh, compare these two trees, there is... Uh, on the left here, a tree that is totally symmetrical, uh, also called balanced. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, here's a tree that is totally asymmetrical or unbalanced or maybe imbalanced. Uh, because, well, there's here from the root a lineage that once it's branched off, uh, doesn't do anything more. It just tr keeps traveling to the present, whereas here, in this lineage, there is um, apparently a much greater ability to diversify. So these, the, here along this branch, um, the capacity for diversification appears to be much higher than here on the other side of the route. For this, there's also a couple of metrics that are uh, also pretty simple. Like, uh, so what I said earlier about the formulas uh, still applies. We're not going to memorize this, but what we're doing here is that we're iterating over all nodes, and uh, we take basically the number of descendants for each node on the left side and on the right side, so we get the absolute difference. Um, and then we do a couple of uh, corrections that are, uh, I guess, needed. But uh, out of that comes a, a number called the uh, imbalance. Uh, also, there's some slight modifications uh, have been proposed, for example, ones that make it so that um, the weighting of deeper nodes, which necessarily will have more descendants in absolute terms, uh, well, you might want to downweight that. So, for example, this this measure here downweights that, so this kind of more uniform across the tree shape. Again, let's not memorize. Just let's remember that there are pretty simple metrics that can tell us if there is perhaps some kind of uh, lineage-specific diversification rate that is higher for some lineage than for others. And to, then to close, well, why are we uh, actually doing all this? Uh, well, here is a, a pretty ancient uh, paper. Um, well, they're all quite ancient. This one's from 92. Doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, what matters here is the following. So based on these pure birth and birth death processes, we can generate what our uh, expectation is for the average imbalance given some number of tips. Uh, for example, here under a Markov model, which is uh, basically a different word for a Yule model. So under the Markov model, this is the expectation for the average imbalance um, as your trees get bigger. 
And then what Steve Hurd did was go through the literature and just collect uh, published trees of these different sizes. So here there's, for example, 26 trees with four tips. Uh, here, 25 trees with five tips and so on. And interestingly, uh, the actual empirical trees from the literature are more imbalanced than our expectation. So these uh, lineage-specific processes where some lineages are really uh, are prone to diversification and others are not, are um, more unevenly distributed across life than uh, our null models would suggest. 